it sure is absolutely a joy to be here this Sunday. Uh, in case you don't know who I am, my name is Carl Decker, and I am the men's minister here at Cypress Creek Christian Church. And I sometimes sneak into the back of the service, so maybe you've seen me there. My wife teaches Sunday school during this hour, so I normally go and support her. And, uh, but it is sure a pleasure to be with you guys today. Uh, as was said earlier, Bruce in a delegation or at the general convention or general assembly, and uh, they're having a wonderful time. I've seen quite a few posts and gotten a few texts back, and it just seems like all great things are going there, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, and then he let the fox come to watch the hen house. So uh, I hope you all are ready. Strap your seat belts on, get them good and tight, because this is going to be a ride today. Uh, we're going to start out with our scripture, which comes from First uh, Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards in God's grace, in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ, and to him be all the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. May God richly bless the reading of his word. Once again, I'm, I'm honored to be here this Sunday. Um, I'm also very honored that my good friend Jeremiah Busby is able to join me as well. And we're going to kind of tag team this sermon a little bit, so a little different than you're probably used to, but it'll work, and hopefully you'll get something out of it. There's a song we're going to sing later called Change My Heart, O God. It is one of my absolute favorite songs. I heard it five years ago for the first time while I was on a men's retreat. I had been drugged there, kicking and screaming by my lovely wife, because I really did not want to be there. It was shortly after I heard that song on a Saturday evening that I prayed that God would change my heart. And I started to engage what was going on during that retreat. As many of my brothers in Christ will tell you, be careful what you ask God for. He's got a great sense of humor, and he does give it to you, and generally not in a way you would expect. Hours later, while on my knees crying like a baby, I answered God's call for my life. As I answered God's call, I realized that if I listened very closely, he would give me clues as to what I was to do next. A year or so later, I became a commissioned minister and was installed here at Cypress Creek Christian Church. A year or so after that, I was on a bus trip to a women's retreat to participate in a special ceremony for them. The retreat was in Austin, and it was the first time this retreat had been held there. So we were all excited. Sixty of us packed on a bus and rode up there to, to this retreat. As I stepped off the bus, I was greeted by a very good friend of mine, Travis Bednarts. Travis is a Catholic and a, a good, a, just a very good friend and a great Christian. And he said, Carl, I'm going to be the lay director for a Kairos prison ministry coming up in March. And we are desperately seeking a couple clergy people to fill in some empty spots. Would you be willing? And that was one of those little voices I was telling you about. And I said, yeah, without even thinking. I said, sure, I'll do it. He caught me at a good moment, by the way. You know, what, was I going to say no? Little did I know that I was following what Jesus tells us to do in Matthew. This comes from chapter 25, starting with verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and take your inheritance. 
The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. This one always gets me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Kairos ministry changed my life. I saw the Holy Spirit at work before my eyes on the first day. We entered the prison for three days, and it was just an awesome time. We also go back quite often to be chaplains so these guys can meet together and pray with each other, fellowship together. My wife Brenda will tell you she loves it when I go there because I come back bouncing like Tigger. It just, if you want to see the Holy Spirit, it's really funny. I find it by going and seeing these brothers in white getting together in fellowship of Jesus Christ. It's just awesome. It was probably my second or third time doing this prison ministry when I roomed with a gentleman named Jim Austin. And he and another friend of his, Bob Lucifer, invited me to attend a halfway house, which was Christian-based, called Spirit Key. They kind of tried to do the Kairos format at this halfway house, and every other Wednesday night we would go, bring dinner, eat dinner with the men, then we'd go into the chapel, have a chapel service, and then we would sit down and have group discussions. It was at one of these, about two years ago, that I met my dear friend Jeremiah. And although I felt we had nothing in, in common whatsoever, I knew that the Holy Spirit was with Jeremiah, and we made a connection. Since then, we have worked tirelessly supporting each other in prayer, in tears, and in ministry. It is very interesting, the people that God puts into your life. Jeremiah will probably back me up on this, what I'm about to say. But probably five or so years ago, we would have really had nothing in common. Am I right, Jeremiah? We probably wouldn't even been friends. Is that true? Well, I'm going to let Jeremiah come up and give his part of this story. So... At this time, I'm going to turn it over to my brother, Pastor Jeremiah. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Carl didn't tell you guys that when we met, talking about nothing in common, we was volunteers to go feed these men and do prayer and show with these men and I was the only African-American volunteer in that place. And when I used to get there, I used to look at God and say, God, what do you have me doing at this place? Talking about nothing that was in common. My name is Pastor Jeremiah Busby. I am the founder and the president of Phoenix Ministries, Rising from the Ashes, which brings rehabilitation, restoration, and reentry to those who have been affected by incarceration. This ministry is so dear to me, and once I begin to share with you guys my story, you would understand, understand why this ministry is dear to me. At the tender age of three years old, I was a typical young, young, young baby that was seeing his mother off to work and was crying because I didn't want to leave, want my mother to leave, and I didn't understand that she just had to go because she had to go to work to pay the bills and didn't know that that would be the final day that I would ever see my mother. She went to work and some guy came into her job and decided to take her life. And not only that, he decided to go farther and to take her body. And to the day, her body or her remains have still not been discovered. Tragedy hit me at a very young age. I didn't have the opportunity to partake in a foster home or, or an orphan uh, system. I was left to be raised by those who was there in an environment that was very clouded by drugs, gangs, and violence. It didn't take long for me to begin to pick up these bad traits 
because these were the traits that I was exposed to day in and day out. By the age of 10, I began to join one of the most vicious and violent gangs known in American history. Uh, young and did not know what I was doing, recruited by the elders of my community, but I joined. By the age, by the age of 11, I began to sell narcotics. By the age of 12, I began to cook narcotics. And at the age of 13, I found myself in the arms of the law, uh, arrested for homicide and was guilty. Six months is what the system, the state of Texas said that that life was worth. They sentenced me to the Texas Youth Commission. At 13 years old, being down in the Youth Commission, I was surrounded by other uh, criminal youths such as myself who had done different things than I have done, but the things that they done sounded very interesting to me. So I took the ideas and the collectives of the things these guys shared with me, put them into my bag of tricks, and six months later was back in the community trying new things that I picked up in Texas Youth Commission. It was two years shortly after that that I found myself back in the arms of the law again for second homicide, and I was guilty. By no means do I mean to highlight the enemy or anything that the enemy done in my life. I'm simply trying to paint a picture to you about the darkness that was in my life on how God reached down deep in the darkness and pulled me out of that darkness. Seven years is what the state of Texas said that life was worth, and I was sentenced to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice at the tender age of 15. Was in prison with grown men and with violent, violent, dark criminals. Done the seven years flat, got out of prison, and went right back to the same old thing. Went into prison at the age of 15 as a monster, came out of prison at the age of 22 as a beast. The prison had breeded and manufactured me into this point since the age of 13. But finally, the judge told me one day when I found myself back in the arms of the law, I was part of a North Texas drug operation that the uh, governor, George Bush at the time, had put us number three on the list. And the governors, and they said that 80 years because you beyond rehabilitation. Society is better off without you, Mr. Busby, so we want to lock you up and throw away the key. I found myself in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice at the famous East Ham unit where Bunny and Clyde had made history at, and I was there with 80 years, eight with a zero. And the warden told me, I don't know if you know, but I'm going to tell you that they sent you here to die. You will never get out of prison alive. You will die here because society has had enough of your activities. He looked at his administrative clerk and said, matter of fact, I want to sign him to the inmate cemetery, what we call a boot hill. And he said, Mr. Busby, do me a favor while you're out there digging graves for your fellow inmates who, who fall away, I want you to mark a spot to where you would like for me to place your body when you die. I live life with that same same mentality that it was over, that I would die here. I lived like dark in prison. Matter of fact, at one time in the prison, I had more correction officers working for me on an illegal drug operation than I did offenders. But I had one offender that I had nothing in common with, but he would always stop and tell me, Jesus love you. And i say, man, get on with that stuff. And he would always say, it's a program that I want you to go to called Kairos. And I would tell him, man, thank you, but no thank you. One thing I know that Kyle Ross, they was famous for, was smiles on their face, and they gave out a lot of hugs. And I didn't want no hugs from nobody. I was bitter and I was angry. So finally, I accepted the man invitation, and I walked into the, to the chapel, and I saw men like my good friend Carl Decker, men who had got it in the scripture. See, the one thing that we don't understand is the system. We, we tough on crime, tough on crime. The system is not called nor is it equipped to bring anyone to a state of rehabilitation. The system is a vehicle that we use as society to carry out justice. You've done a crime due to time. There's no education department or component. There's no reformatory component to prison. 
but it's men like Carl Decker who get the scriptures from the Apostle Paul when he said that we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors of Christ. And they be obedient. It's not the power of the scriptures, the power of the obedience for the men to take the scripture and go into a dark place called prison to bring light called Jesus Christ that would change a life. I went through this walk very dark and was very blinded and met men like Carl Deckel. And instantly, the gospel of Jesus Christ changed my life. Like the psalmist said, I once was blind, but now I see in the prophecy of the warden when I first entered into the prison system, who said I would die there, came to pass because it wasn't a physical death, but it was a spiritual death. And I was resurrected in Christ as a new man and began to live life on a totally different path. Although we have any, nothing common, nothing in common, but the only thing that we did have in common was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that brought me to a new light. See, the problem is the body of Christ has got selfish with the gospel and don't pick this out and say this won't work and that won't work. But God has sent the gospel to you so he can send it through you so he can save a lost world. And what better place to save a lost world than those who found themselves in a dark place called prison? And I know many of you are wondering, how did you get out serving 80 years? I'm telling you, I'm still wondering myself. But I can tell you that I serve a God that deserves all the credit and the glory. I pray that what I share with you guys have blessed you this morning. Continue to keep me in prayer, and I will keep you in prayer as I do what the men like Carl Decker done for me and go back into the prison and take the light in the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God bless you and may God keep you. Y'all notice he accepts hugs now? First, I want to thank you, Jeremiah. I know, it's, I know you love giving your testimony, and it's always powerful. But now it's time to me to finish my testimony. You remember earlier when I said that Jeremiah and I had nothing in common, that we probably wouldn't even be friends? Well, it's not because of what he has done or who he is or was. It's because of what I had done and who I was. Yes, I was a believer. I attended church on Sundays. I grew up in the church. One of my good friends, Roy Beatty, likes to say I had a drug problem. Every Sunday I was drugged to church, drugged to Sunday school. Every Wednesday I was drugged to Wednesday night services. And any time that church was open, I was drugged there. I was even an elder in this very church. But until that change of heart five years ago, I was just punching my time card. The problem was I wasn't a very good Christian. You see, I'd do all those great things on Sunday morning, and I might even make it past lunch. But then it was my old, wet, selfish ways, focused on myself, what I wanted, what I needed. When I arrived at that retreat weekend, once again, kicking and screaming. I had no idea how bad off I was. I soon realized, though, I was a terrible husband, a poor father, a horrible employee, and had no real friends. It took that weekend and God's grace to change my heart to realize I needed to die to myself and to focus on what's most important, my dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I also learned I couldn't do this alone. I needed lots of help. I needed help from my brothers and sisters in Christ. And guess what? 
They needed my help just as much as I needed theirs. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I think that's awesome. It is hard to fight those battles out on the streets alone. It's actually impossible. We can't do it alone. We must come together. I am very honored to serve with my brother Jeremiah and others in the prison ministry and other ministries. And I know there's many at this church that do the same, and I'm thankful for that. And I just hope and pray that the rest of us that aren't doing that would start doing that, even in simple ways. We go into prisons to minister to those who are the worst of the worst, and nine times out of ten, they're ready to receive it, and they take it and they run with it. I believe that's truly what Jesus intends me to do. On rare occasions, I am very blessed by seeing the fruits of, of our labor through Jesus Christ. When an ex-offender gets released from prison and makes a new life for himself while giving God the glory, Jeremiah is a fine example of that, a true success story. And I hope that you will continue to pray for him and his ministry because he's got his work cut out for him. For you see, even if we have nothing in common but the love of Jesus Christ, we can make a difference, and it starts with just a little change of heart. Amen.